we as students uh, and activist students at that time in 1999, we launched something called uh, Fireside Chats. Uh, and then when I became a professor, we launched something called Brown Bags, where we would just actually have students come and bring lunch um, and hear uh, what community people said outside the uh, academy, but also inside the academy. Um, and so that was the genesis of, of that. And then when I got to PHRC, um, just you know, sharing with Tamika ways that we could utilize um, our intellectual property at PHRC. So it's it's a combination of people who are in senior management. It's a combination of folk who are not in senior management. It's not about a, being a member of a hierarchical uh, status. Um, but Tamika was able to capture vision. And I just want to say, as I've always said publicly, thank you so much, Tamika. And we started certainly with you know uh, lunch and learns. Um, with, with staff who had a passion. So our first one was School to Prison Pipeline, uh, where Tamika really unpackaged uh, some of the challenges and complexities around expulsion rates and the targeting of Black or Brown youth feeding uh, what uh, Michelle Alexander calls a new Jim Crow. We moved from there to uh, our hearing examiner, excuse me, our chief hearing examiner, uh, Carl Summerson, uh, talking about in context, uh, race and ethnic intimidation, words have meanings, uh, how to file a complaint under the PHRA, uh, and that was really great. And then the third one we followed up with uh, in November uh, was our director of Fair Housing and the Commercial Property, uh, who just really continues to point out to us the impact that housing discrimination has on all people uh, in the Commonwealth. And so we're really excited that we end uh, this year that for a lot of us has been a troublesome uh, and burdensome year, but also teachable moments. Um, and we end today with our topic, uh, using a policy to affect uh, change. And uh, this is our lunch and learn with our amazing director of, uh, of policy and intergovernmental affairs, Gerlene L. LaRue. And we're also happy to have uh, Mrs. Tricia Steiner uh, from the Derry Township uh, School District. And she's the policy chair there. And so we're really excited that you're joining us. Uh, and lastly, um, our goal when Tamika and I formulated this was to have lunch and learns in the moment where we would treat people to pizza wings and salad and yogurt because we know everyone doesn't eat as unhealthy as I do or I did at the time. Uh, but we've been able to accommodate uh, these lunch and learns uh, online. And so we're really excited. We have lunch and learns that are going to take place in the new year. We already have them scheduled all the way up until uh, the month of April. Uh, and so if you're a member of the PHRC staff and you want to do a lunch and learn, uh, please reach out to Tamika and myself. Uh, and if you're a person in the community and you have a suggestion of a topical uh, matter that you would love for the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission uh, to capture in one of our lunch and learns, please feel free to do that as well. Once again, welcome. Uh, and uh, I'll turn it back over to Tamika. Looking forward to, to listening and learning from uh, both uh, Mrs. Uh, Steiner as well as uh, Mrs. Lewis. Thank you, Tamika. Uh, thank you, Executive Director. At this time, I welcome Ms. Gerline Ger L. Larar Esquire, who serves as our Chairman of Policy, Director of Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs at PHRC. Gerline has been with PHRC for a year and a half now, and it feels like so much longer. Uh, she's a valuable member of the senior management team, and she brings a wealth of experience from uh, the legal field, psychology field, and she is a wife and a mother and a, a valued member of our community, active with the NAACP, amongst many other organizations. So without further ado, I will turn the program over to today's moderator, Attorney Gerline Laurar. Thank you, Gerline. Thank you so much, um, Tamika, uh, for this kind introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to just come and share uh, this moment with us. It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Trisha Steiner uh, as our guest. Um, Trisha Steiner is a school director for Derry Township school district in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Since the beginning of her term in December 2017, she has consistently advocated for the social and emotional health of the school community 
we were focused on equity initiatives and policies. As chair of her board's policy committee, she led the conversation to include gender identity or expression and non-religion in her district's non-discrimination clause and drafted two non-discrimination policies, diversity, inclusion, and equity, which was approved in January 2019, and transgender and gender non-confirming students, which was approved in April 2019. She also revised the dress and grooming policy to remove language that reinforced negative gender stereotypes and added gender neutral language to support equitable educational access. As a member of the Curriculum Council, she worked to champion a fact-based comprehensive sexuality education <laughs> program and strongly advocate for the use of culturally relevant material and the teaching of hard history across disciplines. Outside of Derry Township, Trisha, will the way she's affectionately known, has been a participating member of the Pennsylvania School Board Association's Equity Coordinators Task Force for the past two years, where she contributed to the development of the PSBA educational equity policy, and was also a contributing member of the phase two work group for the Commonwealth Education Blueprint Project. As the elected PSBA Section 7 advisor, Trisha was an active member of the Pennsylvania School Reopening Task Force and regularly engages in committees and discussions with other school directors across the state. Recently, her proposal, a proposal submission for education reparations was considered for the PSBA legislative platform and she is presenting this idea to the Pennsylvania Department of Education, Equity and Inclusion Task Force at their January meeting. Having submitted a separate proposal to the PSBA legislative plus platform regarding funding disparities, Trisha was recently invited to become a member of Pennsylvanians for Fair Funding, an advocacy group working for equitable education funding. A member of the Regional Adolescent Sleep Needs Coalition, she is also a strong advocate for the late start times for secondary students and was a contributing member of her district's school start time committee. Trisha holds a BA in Psychology and Women's Studies from St. Mary's College of Maryland, currently a full-time volunteer, advocate and parent, her previous work experience focus on psychiatric research. She and her partner reside in Derry Township along with their 12th grader, 8th grader, and 11-year-old Great Dane. Thank you so much, uh, Trisha, for joining us today. Um, and I'm sure we're all in for a treat today. And uh, we're excited to have you talk to us about how we can all affect change at the grassroots level. Thank you so much um, for that wonderful welcome. I'm so honored to be here. Um, and I wanna thank you, uh, Mrs. Laura, for inviting me to share my love of policy um, to this group. The thing that I love about policy is that it's all just made up by people. Um, people like us um, and each one of us holds that power to not only affect um, the, the change of policymakers, but we can write the policy ourselves. And that's exactly what I've uh, tried to do as a school director in my capacity there um, to maximize every opportunity and platform um, that becomes available to me uh, to try to make um, at least a little bit of a difference. And I'm always thinking about how I can use my privilege um, and my little bit of power to try to make a difference in someone's life to make it a little bit better, um, which helps all of us. Um, and in my case, since I'm a school director in the education field, I'm always thinking about kids and um, who those kids are going to grow up to be and how their experiences within the educational system shapes them um, and in many cases damages them um, and how we can make that system better for, for all kids. 
why did you decide um, to run for um, to run for school boy? Um. I've always been uh, a very involved parent for my two children and their different grades and different schools. Um, we've lived in uh, different states, um, so we've experienced different uh, systems. Um, I've been, you know, room parent, part of the PTA, PTOs, um, organizing parties and fundraisers, you know, all the fun stuff, book fairs, um, um, parties, chaperoning, field trips. Um, and I, I've always um, really loved all those things and been really engaged um, which has also helped me to advocate on behalf of my kids every time um, there's an issue that that seems to pop up because, um, you know, nothing ever seems to be as easy as it should be um, in education. And um, as a, a, a parent that had the privilege of staying at home, I knew that not other parents had that same um, opportunity. And so I knew that I wanted to be able to advocate not only for my own kids um, on a, a, a larger scale, but for, for all kids. Um, and so not just the, not just the white privileged ones and not just the ones that had stay at home parents, not just the ones who have the loudest voices, but for the kids that don't often um, have people to speak for them. And so I wanted to position myself um, to be on the school board so that I could have the opportunities to, to, do more um, and have more needs for every kid in our district um, where our motto is every child every day. And I just really wanted to see that um, come more of a um, more of a reality instead of just a performative catchphrase. Um, and so that was really what um, has driven me um, just to try to work for, for all the kids that I see around me. Um, and my platform was putting all kids first with a capital A-L-L. -L, and that's really what I've tried to do. <clears throat> what role uh, would you say that policy plays in your capacity as a school director? Um, policy is huge for a school district. It's really the law of the land. Before I was even sworn in as a new school director, I knew that I wanted to um, position myself to be on the policy committee because I feel like that's where the real work gets done. Um, despite what a lot of people think um, about school boards and school directors, um, there's really not that much um, control or power that you have um, as a school director, particularly as an individual member. You really work together as a board, um, and you're really just there to sort of help oversee what happens in the district. There's really a lot of uh, uh, you know, a lot of that power and control comes from the administration. Um, but the one exception is policy. Um, and so policy is really an area that um, you can have a lot more um, influence over. Um, and it really sets the tone for the entire district. Um, and so before I was sworn in, I'd already had changes in mind for how I wanted to add to policy to make it more inclusive, um, to be more representative of our student population um, so that we can provide a better sense of belonging um, for all of the kids within our school community. And so policy has really been um, my focus. So, and can you describe uh, the policy process from start to finish and any challenges along the way that you might have encountered? Yes, so most of our policies come to us through um, the Pennsylvania School Board Association. Uh, which is really um, the association that most school districts in the state are members of, and it really is a service organization for school directors, um, uh, providing educational opportunities, um, advocacy, um, and, and policy um, direction. And so they have a policy services department, and we know with lawyers and other um, experts who closely follow the law, and then they send out updates um, and necessary changes according to um, the changes that are being made to the law on a regular basis. And then we review those at our regular uh, quarterly meetings uh, for, for our policy committee. You'd be surprised how many laws there are um, and how frequently they are amended that, um, require regular changes to, to school policy. 
And so whether it's PA code or state mandates or the federal law, um, these get automatically updated and added to our agenda based on the number of policies that are affected. Um, and then we have to approve those in a timely manner um, based on, on the law that's required of us. Um, so there are those that are sort of mandated by the law and then there are optional policies or optional language um, that can be added to um, our agenda, which any school board member can, can just request um, to the policy chair um, to have that added to the agenda to be added for either discussion item um, or in some cases, if it's a brand new policy, you can have that on there for, for discussion. Um, and so this is the part that is challenging, that has been challenging because um, you know, many entities, whether it's a government institution or a, a corporate, uh, a private corporation, people don't necessarily want to do more than what's required of them by the law. Um, and in fact, in some cases, there is a fear that doing more can put you in um, a legal jeopardy uh, with opposing forces that don't always agree. And so, um, that has always been a challenge to work through, but as a local entity, the school board has the voting rights uh, to adopt anything within their purview as school district policy. And as chair of the policy committee, I've had um, that privilege of having that direct access to agenda planning. Um, and so even with that access, getting an optional item or an optional um, policy itself on the agenda, um, not necessarily on the agenda, but getting getting to it um, in line underneath all the policies that are required by law poses another challenge in and of itself, um, just because these policy meetings are only an hour long, they're sandwiched between other meetings, and there's only so much time to get through what's required. And so, you know, it always seemed like an optional thing you always sort of got stuck at the bottom of the queue. Um, and this had occurred so many times that um, as policy chair, I decided, you know what, I really want these optional policies to, um, to at least have a discussion to try to get some movement on it. And so I scheduled a special meeting um, and, and that wasn't something that I was sure that I could do, but you know, I just said, let's do it and got everybody on board and we did. And that's um, essentially how we ended up getting our two um, non-discrimination policies that I, um, that I drafted um, ultimately passed just because we had to have a special dedicated meeting to get them through. Um, but anyway, uh, in either case, whether it's an optional policy or language or it's one that's um, mandated by the law, it has to first be proved by the policy committee, which is comprised of four school directors and four um, citizen advisors. Um, and then if it moves, if it gets approved by the policy committee, then it moves to the full board um, of, of nine members for uh, discussion and approval. And once it's approved by the full board uh, by majority vote, it then moves to a public comment viewing day for 30 days. Um, or, and unless anyone from the community objects or has any suggestions for modifications, it's automatically adopted on day 31 and goes into our district policy manual as the law of, of the land for the, for the school district and um, will we'll stay there and live there unless any changes or amendments are made um, to it in the future. So you mentioned um, some policies that have to do with discrimination. Um, that you were able to bring through uh, by using the optional, uh, an additional meeting that wasn't previously scheduled. Um, as a black and Haitian woman, uh, when I go places, I often feel that I am viewed through the lenses of white supremacy. Do you believe that white supremacy still exists? And if so, how have you seen it expressed? Yes, absolutely. Um, white supremacy is so pervasive in our culture all around us and it just invades 
um, every single institution um, around us, including um, our school districts and our public schools. And so, you know, it exists in, uh, I, I, you know, I've, <laughs> I've been aware of it as a white parent of privilege, um, but I've been come even more aware of it as a school director and just seeing just the stark disparities between, you know, our school district where we, um, you know, are a white, predominantly white suburban school district. And um, we really like to pat ourselves on the back for having, um, you know, high test scores, um, high ratings across the state. And, you know, those are wonderful things. And I don't want to, um, you know, put down the students in our school district that work hard um, to achieve those, those successes. But, um, you know, it's not because our students in our school district are any more intelligent or smarter than, you know, other kids in other school districts in that are, have predominantly black and brown populations, um, like Harrisburg, like Steelton, like uh, Lebanon, like Lancaster, um, just around central Pennsylvania. It's because our white suburban school district is a direct ben beneficiary of white supremacy um, you know, and you can make that correlation back to redlining um, and Brown versus Board of Education. And, um, you know, and all these white suburban school districts have sort of popped up um, in these, you know, quote unquote, more desirable locations that were deemed by, um, by redlining. And so with that has come um, sort of a hoarding of resources. The white supremacy is just, it's so pervasive and it's everywhere and, and it's really trying to um, examine our school system and our structures um, from outside of a, you know, for, especially for, for a white person and a white educator is stepping outside of that place of white, um, of whiteness and, and of white privilege to try to um, look through it because it's so pervasive that it's even hard to, to identify it and to name it and to see it in all cases. Some places it's clearly obvious. Um, it's, it's so obvious in the, the funding formula, which is called the FAIR funding formula, which is obviously so very unfair. Um, and there's been you know, study after study to, to prove that the funding is, is blatantly racist and unfair. Um, so much so that there's a, um, you know, a, a court case um, right now that's hopefully will pick back up that was on hold because of the pandemic, but um, where the board, where the PD is being sued by um, uh, several school districts and groups of parents because of the funding formula being so unfair and so despairing um, of black and brown students. And so it's everywhere. It's really, it's, <laughs> I could talk forever because it's just, a, it's, it's never ending. Um, and um, it's and it shows up in on every single level, and it shows up in policies and practices, um, and the way that we treat um, each other, and the way that we treat students. Um, it's in the way that we don't have, um, you know, a black and brown uh, workforce of teachers, um, because again, back to Brown versus Board of Education, when all those teachers, um, you know, were lost their jobs, um, you know, were blatantly fired um, because they didn't want black and, teaching black and brown kids. They wanted white teachers to teach, um, to teach black kids. And so there's just so many things. And when you start to sort of change your lens um, to look at it um, outside of a white patriarchal Christian um, structure, then you really just see it, start to see it everywhere. And there's so much to uncover and so much to um, to undo, to dismantle, so that we can really get to the heart of it, the meat of it, so that we can um, help help children and help not only black and brown children and um, indigenous children um, and other children of color, but also white children to understand the real history of our country, uh, which has been so whitewashed in every single classroom um, to really get at the at the, at the bottom of it so that we can just work to change our culture. So what I, um, thank you so much for giving such a courageous, um, you know, description of how uh, white supremacy permeates, uh, you know, our lives. What can anyone do? 
regardless of um, you know race, gender, or creed, uh, do again at the grassroots level to start dismantling uh, the power and the results and the residues of white supremacy by using policy. Um, yeah, so by using policy, I think that, um, first of all, I think that everybody needs to do the internal work to have a better understanding of, um, of, of our history and, and, and whiteness and in our place within it. Um, and, you know, just like read, 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 read. Like I, I have just read so many books. Um, and, and listen, if you're not a reader, there's a lot of podcasts, um, just on white supremacy and on, you know, the racial disparities and racism. Um, there's just, there's so much information. And so really just trying to consume as much information um, to do that internal work for yourself to constantly analyze um, and everything. But, um, <clears throat> and then once you have a, a, a good understanding um, of that for yourself, then to really, try to look at the policies um, to see how you can affect change um, in your local community. And really that's, can be done on every level, you know, whether that's, you know, just going to your local school board meeting um, and speaking out about this, even if it's not on the agenda, you know, there are opportunities um, within every public uh, government meeting to have a, a voice, uh, to voice your opinion on matters that are important to you, on matters that things should be addressed matters that should be looked at. Um, we had a community uh, citizen advisor on um, one of our um, other committees for finance committee who brought up um, who, who brought up the history of um, one of the banks that we were looking at and the, their their um, involvement in in chattel slavery and how they you know not only you know user users of but how they profited how their bank corporation profit off of it and so that maybe we should consider something um, another bank for our loan you know so it can be done on every single level and it's something it's it's there are instances where institutions you know are just unaware might not even think about it because white supremacy is so pervasive that it's so hard to to see it um <clears throat> and to name it and so you know whether it's your school board or your board of supervisors um you know, or trying to reach out to other community members to make those connections so that you're not just operating in a silo or reading books by yourself or um, thinking that, you know, if I'm the only one that feels this way and then how can I make this change up by myself? Like really trying to reach out and find other community members, whether it's the NAACP or, you know, an indivisible group or other equity um, or diversity inclusion groups that are out there. There are groups out there that are working to try to um, dismantle racism and, and network together to create opportunities for education um, for everyone. So um, we cannot speak about education for everyone and, and racism and white supremacy on the, uh, without mentioning <clears throat> the issue of microaggressions um, and especially in a district um, you know especially in districts that are um, predominantly you know white and that there are some uh, students of color uh, sprinkled <laughs> throughout um, <clears throat> I would uh, say I would assume that this is an issue that might have come to your to your attention, uh, could you, ex you know, describe how this has come to your attention and what, if anything, you've done in terms of policy to address that? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, I think that you know microaggressions take place uh, constantly, all the time, in ways that people aren't even aware of. And I say people, I mean white people. So. Again, I'm talking to people, I should preference it as white people because white people are just very unaware of microaggressions and some of the pain and hurt that they cause. Even if their intent is something different, um, the impact um, can be completely devastating um, for either a student or another person. 
Um, and so, you know, I think that happens, I think it happens a lot, even on just, you know, even in, even in, in gestures or unspoken body language, um, especially when you're dealing with kids and children um, in a classroom, if, if, you know, if a, if, if kids, if a teacher doesn't address something that's where, when a remark is made that another kid is, you know, that is offensive or hurtful to another kid's identity, um, and a teacher just ignores it, I think that can cause a lot of harm because then it's just saying, okay, that's okay. Um, and, you know, after even reading and exploring about it and doing more of that internal work for my own self, um, you know, I realized instances of, of, in my own experience where I had um, violated against somebody else by causing microaggression. And, and one thing that like glaringly can't comes to mind um, when talking about microaggressions is um, I, you know, met um, a black woman in my community um, a couple years ago. And the first time that I met her, um, you know, her hair was, was just like closer to her, to her head and it was styled in a way that um, I thought it was really cool, but I didn't comment on it. Um, the next time that I saw her, um, her hair was straight. Um, and so for some reason, because of, because of white supremacy and, and, and my white culture that I was consumed, that I'm consumed in, I felt the need to comment on her straight hair. Um, you know, and in my head, I justified it as, okay, like, this is a woman that I want to befriend. Um, I think her hair looks really pretty as a person with my own curly hair. I know how hard it is to straighten your hair. So I sort of justified in my head as, you know, I'm commenting her on her straight hair um, because I think, I think it looks nice. And I even felt the need to touch her hair. Um, so, you know, why as a white person, as a white woman who I wanted to actually be friends with this person, why would I do that? You know, why? would I not only comment on her straight hair, um, but why did I feel the need to, to reach out and touch it as I'm commenting? Um, and so I, and it was one of those things where I like kind of recognize it on some sort of conscious level, but I, but not enough to like stop myself. And it wasn't until I was reading, you know, doing some of this internal work for myself later where I was reading, you know, like a chapter about hair and how, um, <clears throat> how damaging those comments about hair can be um, and how, you know, because why, why would we need to comment her because her hair was straight, like a white woman's hair is straight, like this white beauty standard for straight hair. And um, <clears throat> so that was really sort of a moment for me where I just felt like, okay, it, it was, it was a little bit of an awakening. And I knew that next time I encountered this person I needed to apologize and tell them that I was doing this work, that I wanted to be an anti-racist, that I was working to be toward anti-racism for myself and for my community. And, um, and the next time I saw her, um, which I was happy to see her, um, to have the opportunity, I did. Um, and um, luckily for me, she was gracious enough to, to accept that apology and um, my authenticity in, in trying to express that. Uh, but that was just one instance of one microaggression. And I'm sure that I have done many others that I'm unaware of, but that was just one sort of thing for me personally um, that I'm sure happens to a lot of, um, of, of people. And I'm sure white people do um, to other black people, even with the best of intentions. Um, you know, my intent was to try to compliment her because I wanted to be her friend. I mean, instead I was, you know, making a totally racist comment. And so it's just little things like that and, and, and becoming aware and, and having the, the vulnerability to talk about it in an open way so that we can all learn from each other's experiences, especially white people, um, because you know we're the ones that do this damage and we are the ones that need to do the work um, and understand the history and learn it so that we can um, be better. So um, Tamika Hatcher mentioned um, so that's a great point about intent versus impact. Whether one intends to be offensive or not, that does not change the impact of uh, a microaggression. And I believe um, this debate about uh, impact, intent versus impact, might have been what, have, uh, what has prevented uh, us to move forward in, in implementing policies that would actually 
um, change uh, these microaggressions from taking place. Uh, can you think of any work, uh, policy work that could be done in that arena to prevent microaggressions from happening, whether it's, it's the school uh, school sy system or workplace or the community at large? Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. And, and even, you know, just to go back to hair, you know, one, one thing within policy that can be addressed is the dress code. Um, you know, and, and thinking about hair and what happened with, you know, that New Jersey wrestler who, uh, where the referee insisted that he cut off his dreadlocks in order to, co to, com to compete as an athlete, you know, and how just ridiculous that is. So looking at um, the dress code policies and not even just dress code within the district, but, you know, those sort of codes and rules within, um, you know, PIAA and sports leagues and competitions um, across, you know, not only just our state, but the country really. And, um, <clears throat> and so I think, you know, just this, this, this white standard of, 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 of dress and hair and um, this expectation that is just unrealistic to, to letting people be who they are. Um, so that's just one small arena, but, but really, you know, <clears throat> um, looking at equity policies, diversity and inclusion initiatives, and, you know, those have been um, sort of buzz phrase buzz phrases, buzzwords um, in education community. Um, even I've only been a school director for three years, but in talking to other um, school directors that have been doing this work for, for much longer, you know, these changes have been talked about for, you know, for, for 20 years or more um, about um, diversity and inclusion. I think before that it was multiculturalism. And so it's about trying to move, move beyond the, the trendy words or the buzzwords and really getting past the performative action into the heart of um, not only policy, but the practices because the policy affects the practices. And so it's really following through on every single level and analyzing every single um, action that's done um, to make sure that it's, there's constant work that's, that's being done and, and that there's accountability for those practices and for those policies um, and that it's constantly evolving and changing to fit the needs of kids to make sure that we are, you know, providing the necessary um, education um, for, for our staff members on microaggressions and implicit bias um, so that we're providing you know, not, not, and not just to our teachers, but to every staff member, you know, every, every bus driver, every cafeteria worker, every custodian, um, you know, every, every adult that has an interaction with, with a child should be a positive one, should be one where the child feels like they have a sense of belonging and they are a citizen of that community because that is their right. Um, instead of this culture of whiteness that excludes um, kids that are not white and people that are not white and teachers that are not white. And so it's also trying to look at those policies and practices of, of hiring and how we can do better at getting a more representative um, teaching staff. Um, <clears throat> there's so many studies that have been done, you know, if a, if a, if a student of color or black student has um, a teacher of color, then they like they're modes of success just exponentially um, get are, are so much better. Um, oh, and it, yes, go ahead. Sorry, oh, I could, sorry. no, no, go ahead. please interrupt me because I could talk more. Um, well, you know, this is, uh, you know, I find this to be a very, uh, um, an occasion and an opportunity for us all to have a, an intimate conversation where we can be, you know, open and honest. And Tamika Hatcher, um, um, who had a question about uh, how rural and suburban school districts uh, can improve uh, to work with diverse teachers. That's a question that she has, but she also would like an opportunity to chime in. So, um, you know, I would like to give her that opportunity. Thank you, thank you. I, I have to chime in here. I'm raising my hand, Trisha, you're, you're hitting some excellent, excellent, like really, really salient points and, uh, I appreciate that you used that example. Uh, I looked up the young man's name, uh, Andrew Johnson. 
Yeah. Andrew Johnson was a young man and it was New Jersey. It was a New Jersey school district that this happened in. And when you talk about policies, uh, dress, code, hair, things like that, this example, um, this is a great example of something that goes far, far beyond a microaggression. And I think that microaggression in and of itself is a misnomer in general, even when we're talking about uh, things that are, um, they're, they're all harmful, but something, um, oh, there, there are so many, like, I mean, there are so many that I, I can think of. Like over the years, I've heard so many things like, oh, well, you're cute to be dark skinned, something like that. Or, oh, well, let me touch your hair as, as you alluded to, those types of things. But what happened to Andrew Johnson went even beyond a microaggression that you could blow off, like, well, that was just an ignorant comment. They, that was a physical assault on that young man. And it, it, it goes so much deeper. It affected his psyche, like to cut his hair like that. Um, hair is a physical and a spiritual thing. And for that young man, his hair was a, a an expression of his culture and his connection to his Caribbean roots and to his father. And so as he is going into the field of competition, he ended up winning anyway, like despite the trauma that was imposed on him and, and it was traumatic um, and the embarrassment, the humiliation, and all the shame that he was subjected to. Um, I dare say that a lot of these things, going back to your original point about intent versus impact, a lot of times people in schools, they know what they're doing and there is intention behind these actions and it can have a extremely detrimental impact on students. And that is a, a very fine example and one of the um, one of the more traumatic and uh, dramatic examples that we are are seeing in school. So thank you. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I, I, that off the top, like that's a great policy example about how schools can um, we sometimes use the pretext of, well, there's a policy, everybody should go by the policy, but we don't always adhere to the policies or have those policies on its face. They look like they're neutral, but they can adversely affect one or more groups more than they do others. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Tamika, um, for your comments. You know, uh, listening to Tamika um, um, expressing the pain that, that um, clearly um, these students uh, might have felt. I, I, I started wondering in my heart, um, is, is, there, is there a hatred, uh, you know, is there a black hate, you know, is there a hatred of, the, of blackness, um, you know, that permeates, uh, you know, our lives? Um, you know, I just, I just want to be transparent. This really made, made me wonder, um, how would you respond to that question? Um, yeah, I think, yes. Um, you know, as, I mean, unfortunately, I think that that is true. Um, I, I think that it's hard for me as a white person to, I guess, to admit that, that there is so much hatred um, and not just blame it on ignorance, but it's also hard to avoid the obvious um, that even in, in, the face, in the face of obvious, um, people, you know, white people still don't want to admit the, the hatred. Um, and that's why it's so hard to dismantle um, these systems and structures um, because they, they, they are in place for a reason. You know, the education system is working exactly as it was designed to. Um, it, it, it was designed, you know, to promote whiteness, to promote white children and their successes, to give, um, to make it easier and to make it, you know, at, at the expense of of non-white um, children and their families and to continue to keep them down and perpetuate the lies and the, the, the myths um, and the stories that this country continues to tell over and over and over again. Um, you know, and we've seen it, um, you know, we've seen it with the recent administration and the, the gag order on um, even talking about equity, um, education and diversity. Um, and, you know, in response to the 1619 project and more schools wanting to um, have a more accurate, accurate um, account of, of our true history, 
um, with, that's you know being responded with the 1776 project as if we're not already talking about um, the whiteness and the founding fathers and the mythologies that they um, you know ha have have given to this country and and instead of talking about the founding fathers as you know real multi-layered people who also own slaves um, you know that's all those things are always ignored um, in the myth of of America so. So yeah, yes, Miss Laura, your question is is um, is hard and and striking, and but it's unfortunately I think that there is hatred, and I think that um, the only way to get through that hatred is to shed light on the truth. Um, I still believe in um, the goodness of of people, and I think that there's been so many people that have been misled and lied to and lied to on every single pervasive level and they believe the myth, they believe the lies. Um, and so I really believe strongly in education as um, shedding light on those things. And hopefully we can move through, through the hate because it's not the kids. Um, I think the kids are so ready to live in a world where that we all wanna see. It's, it's the adults. Um, it's the parents um, that are the ones that keep perpetuating this this type of hatred. So, as an as an active um, anti racist, you know, or, or self proclaimed um, anti racist, um, if you have and 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 I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that you. Um, have expressed yourself openly as an anti-racist, uh, how easy it is it uh, once you have pretty much um, gotten out of the closet per se as an anti-racist to get uh, buy-in from the community to support, um, you know, a policy that, that you're trying to pass that obviously um, might go against um, the powers that be. Right. It's it's hard. It's it's really it's really challenging. I feel like um, for me, you know, the change is never fast enough, um, and I um, I'm not very patient person. So that's something that I have to really practice. Um, but it's a constant balancing act. Um, especially with uh, the government where you have people that have temporary terms and positions that can be voted on um, for and by the people. Um, and so it's really, you know, trying to push through um, these anti-racism initiatives um, without, in a way that you can communicate effectively with the community so that they understand that this is for the benefit of everyone. This is for the humanity and dignity of all of our children um, instead of um, isolating them so that, you know, some extreme members of the community that don't agree with you will want to run for your position and then undo all the progress that you just made. And so it's really sort of a, a balancing act because there's it's hard to maintain that same level of consistency um, across a time period where you have multiple people um, that run for these term positions um, that are voted for by your community. And so that's why it's so important to um, work with your community and communicate effectively with the community. And that's something that, you know, um, I think is a constant struggle, especially in a predominantly white school district or white community where these issues um, have, you know, become political, you know, for some reason, you know, the human dignity of people is a political argument. Um, for some reason, Black Lives Matter is a really, um, you know, polarizing um, statement and movement, um, even though we're just talking about honoring the lives of black people and black children and having space for them to talk about that and be their authentic selves. And so it's, you know, it's, it's mind blowing to me that that's how pervasive white supremacy is that we can't even have spaces um, for our children of color to be themselves. 
Um, and so it's really, you know, it's just heartbreaking. Um, and it's, and it's really frustrating for me um, as a white person, and as a school director to try to um, wait, you know, to, to have to, um, to have to sort of halt in the face of the fear of the backlash that we're constantly getting um, so that we don't um, diminish the progress that we've made. And so it's, 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 it's a constant balance that uh, school directors and school administrators have to, have to, um, have to juggle. And, um, you know, it's never fast enough for me because I just, just don't understand why, you know, kids are struggling, kids are facing trauma that we're doing to them as a school system and a structure. Um, and it's up to us to make sure that we, um, you know, stop doing that and love them. Um, and I don't think it should be that hard to love people and to love children, especially. Um, but unfortunately, back to your previous question, you know, there is just this pervasive level of, of, of white supremacy. And um, the only explanation for it, you know, is to, is to, move, is, is to move beyond this hate um, to shed light on the dignity of, of our black children. So <clears throat> despite the resistance from the community, um, how have you been able to pass some policies? Um, how has your work in your school district affected other school districts? Um, I think that it's, it hasn't affected anybody like necessarily directly, but I do feel like um, because I have spoken out about um, some of these, uh, about racism and, and having these policies in our district, it's empowered other school districts. Um, and so uh, I've been in, you know, other meetings and um, platforms with other school directors um, through my um, connections with the Pennsylvania School Board Association, where I've had school directors, you know, email me or um, comment to me, you know, where can I find your policy? Um, and because they want to use it sort of as a model for their school district, or at least as a model to start a conversation in their school district, um, where they might not have as much support. And, you know, just even just a couple of years ago, when I was first trying to introduce these policies, there wasn't really a template, there wasn't a template for um, an equity, diversity and inclusion policy. Um, so <clears throat> it was really just that networking ability to try to get with other um, school districts and, and, and school board members that wanted to do the same kind of thing. Um, and people thinking, oh yes, like policy, like we can do this. Um, and so, um, and be Hello? Hello, we can, uh, did you get disconnected? I don't know what's going on. It's showing that she's still logged on, but it looks like her, her camera has gone out and her sound for some reason. Right. Let's see if she again. Bandwidth problems, someone says. <laughs> that could be. Um. Now she's gone. Now she's dropped off. She's going to come back in. So while we're waiting, do we have any other questions? Anything from um, members of the staff or our guests? I, I'd like to acknowledge our, our visitors who are in the room today. I see so many of our interagency task force members and community advocates. Thank you all so much uh, for showing up. Um, I see Mar Dr. Margaret is here and Elaine Curry. Corbett Anderson, I see that Kava Brunson is here with us. We have Michelle Nutter. Who else? I don't want to miss anyone, but for um, all of you who are, oh, Councilwoman Janet Diaz is with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Trisha is back in the room. I just let her back in. Jonathan Fox from Lancaster. Thank you so much. He's with our Lancaster County Advisory Council to the PHRC. And um, I'm sure there's some others. Some of you are in here by phone number and I'm not recognizing it. So thank you all so much for showing up. We appreciate your participation. Do we have you back, Tricia? Yes, I'm sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I just totally got dropped. I apologize. 
Thank you so much. My we also, we also Bye. have several members of the TCFDW. Uh, thank you so much, ladies, for, for chiming in. Say hello. <laughs> Please tell us DCFDW, what's the acronym? What's our president? Jody Wibarczyk, would you like to say it? Yes, thank you. It's Tri-County Federation of Democratic Women. And thank I'm you. also here today as a Susquehanna Township Commissioner. Thank you. Um, Welcome. So unfortunately, we only have a couple of minutes left. So I will ask um, uh, Trisha Steiner to please we're not, if we're not an elected official, like we're not on the school board, we're, you know, we're not lawyers, you know, we just, we're, let's say we are someone who just wants to make a difference um, in our community, uh, dealing with all the issues that you talked about. Uh, give us a closing statement on how anyone can actually make a difference yes, using thank policy. You. Yes, thank you. Well, I think anybody can make a difference. Um, don't settle for the status quo. If you actively engage and don't let the culture of fear and backlash break you down. Um, and you don't have to be an expert. Um, you just have to be authentic and realizing that um, when you help the most vulnerable, you bring everybody up it been, everybody benefits. And so, um, and also to speak up and speak your mind, even when you think nobody is listening, even when you think nobody agrees with you. And even when you think that it won't make a difference at all, because someone is listening, um, whether it's at a school board meeting or a supervisor meeting or um, in your friend group, um, somebody in, in your, in your family, somebody is listening and what you do say, um, what you do and say matters. Um, and it has a rippling effect that can open up doors to more and more opportunities and networks uh, to do more and more good, to have more of these conversations um, so that you can affect more positive change in your communities on every level around you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I do wanna thank, um, uh, I do want to thank the executive director for his vision, Tamika Hatcher and um, Laura Algenbright uh, for their assistance. Um, as, as usual, thank you, Tamika, for your thoughtful comments. And I will have one more question. Um, if there's one more question before we adjourn. Um, and as Gerlene is, is capturing that question, Trisha, I just want to say to you, um, thank you so much for being a wonderful resource to us. And please don't be surprised if we call you again and reach out to you to help us uh, to serve as a trainer on this particular subject. And what I find as a trainer myself is that when you go into the space, people need to hear from others who are like them, and sometimes they might be more effective. And so as we move forward, with our education division and providing training to school districts and school boards. I think someone like you who is doing this anti-racism work would be would serve as an excellent resource for other school districts who are experiencing this very same problem. And we know that we have this in, in at all 67 counties in Pennsylvania. So if you get an invitation from us, please don't be surprised. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um... Thank you, um, Tamika. Thank you again, Trisha Steiner, for being vulnerable and, and true. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, goodbye. Have a good afternoon. Happy thank holidays. You. Thank you.